pads are about to come on for the Cincinnati Bengals at training camp, and we still haven't seen Jamar Chase. What's going on? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. Today, we dive into the continued absence from practice for Jamar Chase, who has been physically present, but a non-participant in Cincinnati Bengals practices so far. There are five practices in. Pads are coming on in their next practice on uh, Tuesday. And we're not expecting to see Jamar Chase then either. We're part of the Lockdown Podcast Network here on Lockdown Bengals, covering your team every day on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcast. Shout out to the everydayers. Shout out to all of you who make us your first listen. Appreciate all of the regulars. And shout out to everyone new as well. You can subscribe to the show, of course, and that makes it easy to find our content when we upload Every day. Today's episode is sponsored by FanDuel, where every day this summer you're going to get a daily boost or bonus. You can find it all summer long at fanduel.com. And James, Zach Taylor addressed the media before practice when we still didn't see Jamar Chase and kind of put his foot in his own mouth a little bit when he said all the healthy players were expected to play in practice with pads. And then later had to clarify that uh, that probably wouldn't include Jamar Chase, but at this point, you're getting chance at practice. What's your take on what's going on with Jamar Chase? Well, he's clearly healthy. He's catching uh, balls after practice, getting a little extra work in there, or getting some work in there, I should say. It's not extra if you're not practicing. But this is a hold-in. And what is a hold-in? Jamar Chase is saying, I want a new contract before I practice. He hasn't physically said that to us. But that's what his actions are saying. And that's it. It is that cut and dry. It's that simple. We haven't heard his agent spout off, by the way, to anyone. And and it's been pretty much radio silence from Jamar's camp. And we we heard what the Bengals had to say during their media day, whether it was Mike Brown or Duke Tobin, et cetera, that it's going to be hard, that they want to get something done. Mike Brown saying they'd bend over backwards, all of those things. And I think Jamar's like, okay, well, let's – work on something. Let's get something done. The market's set. Why wait? And so where I'm at, Jake, is the how long. Because clearly it's not just a week. I don't think it ends this week. Doesn't feel like it's going to end next week. Now we're start starting to uh, flirt the end of next week, preseason game number one. Like it's going to happen quick. Things are going to pick up quick. And not that I expected Jamar to play in that game, but it doesn't feel like he's going to play in any of the preseason games. It doesn't feel like, and I don't know about you, but to me, I I don't know when the end is if things continue to stay the way they are now. Do you agree or disagree with that? Are you that concerned? Because I could totally see this going into, we're at the end of July. It feels like it's going to go into mid to late August unless something changes. Yeah, you could definitely see that happening. And the if something changes is likely a contract extension which the Bengals have told us they don't feel is likely to occur before this season starts but Jamar Chase's actions certainly tell you that he is open to that happening and if that is the case as we've discussed in the past that answers the question of well maybe Jamar isn't ready to do the deal and that's why the Bengals haven't gotten it done yet well now it's pretty clear that or or easy to infer let's say that Jamar Chase is ready to do the deal and, and that puts mm-hmm. the ball probably back in the Cincinnati Bengals court, I would imagine. Even if they're having conversations and they said they're having conversations or they've had a conversation with Jamar Chase's agent, clearly it's not done. And maybe it's close. I, I think that the initial optimistic read on it that, you know, maybe it's close and that's why Jamar is just waiting to sign on the dotted line before he participates in practice. That becomes less likely every day he doesn't practice and every day we get the same kind of vague story about a plan from Zach Taylor. And there were some people initially that when we first question, is this a hold in? And the answer at that point was yes. And it's still yes. We're like, well, what about what Zach said when he said he's just trying to get some extra time for the new guys with Joe Burrow? Mm-hmm. Well, is five days enough? Is a few padded practices enough? 
Uh, I think that any credibility that you might have initially given those comments from Zach Taylor is probably gone at this point. And we don't know exactly what's going on. We don't know what's happening behind closed doors, what Jamar's level of participation is in non-practice uh, preparation work that the Cincinnati Bengals are doing for the season. But it is hard to imagine anything changing dramatically unless a contract extension is done before it's time to prepare for the regular season. And that's unfortunate. And and fans are starting to feel that, I think, judging from the reaction at practice on Monday. Yes. And so what's next? How does this how does this play out? Well, it's pretty simple. They're playing a who blinks first game. And we know the Bengals history. Very rarely, if ever, do they blink in these situations. And so my question for Jamar would be, the only question, and by the way, Jamar, call me, would be happy to talk to you. I've told him 15 times since camp opened that I, I would love to talk to him. And he just gives me the same little smirk and laughs. And we'll talk about stuff that certainly isn't contract related. If you're not willing to take this into the regular season, then it really doesn't matter. It doesn't impact the Bengals really at all. And that's that's where it gets interesting to me. And people are, are going to hear that and be like, oh, my God, James, you're crazy. Well, who's Jamar hurting right now? You think Mike Brown is shaking because Jamar isn't practicing a ton and, and they're going to just do whatever Jamar wants, which what I would guess, what I would assume is a three-year deal that has the same – percentage of guarantees that Justin Jefferson had the same AAV that Justin Jefferson had the 35 million over three. And if I'm the Bengals, I get why they wouldn't do that. And they would want to do it over four and, and spread it out and all of those things. And so I, I think that's, again, that's pure speculation. I have no idea how negotiations have gone, but if you're Jamar, what's, what's the benefit of this or how can you actually make your, make it, feel like you're not there and make that make an impact with that and hurt the team. And I don't mean hurt the guys in the locker room. I mean, hurt the organization. The only way to do that and to like have some kind of leverage is to be willing to go into week one like that is to be willing to go into week two like that. And, and that's where it gets interesting because I do wonder if Jamar would be built, be willing to do that. But if he's not, well, then this is something that's going to be a non-story in a month or whenever he does come back. And it would probably be around a month from now. But just the, the that's got to be the question. That's got to be, sorry, that's got to be the question his camp had to have answered before he started this. I think the issue is that he's in the fourth year of his rookie deal. It's not like a Chris Jones holdout where he's been paid a bunch of money. He's on a veteran contract. There are serious repercussions if you miss time in the rookie deal as far as getting those, you know, depending on how much time it's missed. I don't think this could possibly go into the regular season for a player in Jamar Chase's situation. I could be wrong about that, but the the quote-unquote leverage you're talking about, it's hard for me to imagine that existing for a player going into the fourth year of their rookie deal. It, it just, in the current CBA environment, that leverage doesn't really exist. You have to be really willing to, to go really hard line about it. And I think showing up for camp in the first place tells you that that is unlikely to be the plan. Well, he had he had to show up for camp to your point because he had to accrue that year. That year had to toll. And so if he didn't show up for camp and was like a hold out, then it doesn't. And then that rookie deal doesn't continue and you get that year of uh, accrue that year. But he could show up in like week eight or week seven or it's one of those weeks. I haven't gone that far down it. But like if the point is, if he's not willing to do that, then what are we really doing here? Because it's just going to be making a lot about nothing and it might not get anything done anyways. Hopefully, it is getting stuff done behind the scenes. And they are pushing on both sides to get something done. That would be, again, the optimistic hope, I think, for our listeners. We have a lot of injury notes to get to as well while we wait for a resolution on what's going on with Jamar Chase. There are no real answers there outside of it's contract related by all appearances. He continues to do a little bit of work after practice. He continues to interact with his teammates during practice. And Zach Taylor continues to say that he's on the same page with Jamar Chase. So you take that all for whatever it's worth. 
And we'll get back to the rest of the team, including a lot of veterans that had an off day on Monday in preparation for pads coming on and some of the bumps and bruises that are accumulating for the Bengals coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. And right now, well, there isn't much going on outside of, wait, the Olympics, outside of Major League Baseball, outside of NFL Futures bets. The point is, is there's never a downtime for FanDuel. And that's why all summer long, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone all summer long with FanDuel. Maybe you want to get in on the Olympics because you think LeBron James and Steph Curry and Team USA is going to handle business and win gold. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're going to go against America. No. Maybe you think it's going to be one of these other teams that are really, really talented. Well, you can wager on that and so much more with FanDuel. So whether it's Cincinnati Reds, whether it's Bengals Futures, whether it's the Summer Olympics, head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. Again, that is FanDuel.com. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. James, we have some injuries to catch up on. Closing thoughts on Jamar Chase there. We ran out of time a little bit. Are the there could be another wide receiver deal here imminently. And that could apply additional pressure to the Cincinnati Bengals to get things done. C.D. Lamb and Dallas have been talking. Jerry Jones had, or, or someone in the Jones family, I thought it was Jerry. There was a long quote coming out of Dallas from ownership about their continued contract negotiations with some of their stars on Monday. And if that gets done as well, pressure continues to pile up for the Cincinnati Bengals and getting something done with Jamar Chase. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, – man, could you imagine if a C.D. Lamb deal got done and it, it was just entrenching the Justin Jefferson money or a little more than Justin Jefferson or Tyreek Hill gets added money to his deal? Who knows? But that is the other element here. And if they can do – and let's just say they could do the Justin Jefferson deal four years. And if you're Jamar, would you really turn that down? because it's, there's a fourth year there. I, I think if I'm the Bengals, I would make Jamar do that and turn it down, even if he's saying three years, so he's not under contract for six. I would say four-year extension on top of the two, we have you for the next six, and basically give you the Jefferson deal and make him turn that down, and maybe that's what they're doing. Maybe they're making him ride it out right now. He wants three, they want four. Who knows? But if you can get him for the Jefferson deal – Given the receivers that are going to come up, it's going to feel fine in a few years. It just is. I promise the wide receiver market isn't going to just stop. And this is this will be proof if a C.D. Lamb deal gets done or any of these other receivers get done. So we'll see. But there, there's a lot of reasons why it would be nice if the Bengals could, could lock up Jamar. And I get wanting him for four years. And maybe that's the snag. I think that's an optimistic take, by the way. I'm not sure that's the snag, three versus four. That would be the snag if James, the GM, uh, were running the show. But James, the GM, is not running the show. Yeah, I was going to comment that wouldn't it be nice if it were so simple as one year? Like, if that's the case, (laughs) wouldn't that be nice? That that seems like, a, I mean, a significant hurdle to clear, but nonetheless, something simple and, and easy to understand than perhaps what is going on. And we don't know the complexity of it. Like you said, we're speculating a little bit there, but there, there can only be increased pressure to get it done as time goes on one way or another. You're, you're starting to hear it from fans certainly as well uh, a little bit with, with what's going on at camp practices where they want to see Jamar Chase practicing as well. So uh, along with Jamar Chase, many veterans did not practice on Monday and this was planned essentially the entire Starting offensive line, all the veterans on that offensive line did not practice on Monday. Sam Hubbard, after walking to the cart, getting an MRI on his knee after Sunday's practice, came back okay. Sounds like they avoided anything serious with Sam Hubbard, got lucky there, and will take luck when it comes to early training camp injuries. Sounds like Trey Hendrickson has been dealing with something. Again, Zach called it minor, but did not want to disclose. He said he wasn't required to disclose. So did not want to disclose any details there, but some bumps and bruises piling up a little bit for some of the veterans on this team and a planned off day as Zach emphasized on Monday that the plan was to get to Tuesday with pads coming on and all healthy players expected to participate with the asterisk besides Jamar Chase's name when the pads are on on Tuesday. 
Yeah, and that includes Joe Burrow. And the plan tentatively was two on, one off, two on, one off. And I think they realized, all right, first padded practice, you have an off day. Let's give you a little time on Monday. And he also sat out the, of, the, of the final team period. It was still involved, but there was a lot of handoffs today, a lot of run game, not as much downfield from the offense at all. And it still was able to get some nice reps in there, but this was clearly a light day for Joe Burrow and a light day for really the passing offense in general. And I think that's why he is going to practice tomorrow. They're clearly going to give him some periods off. I also think Joe last week was like, all right, I don't need a full day off <laughs> probably. Like let's, let's still get some reps in daily and be consistent with it. And it also coincides with the, the pads coming on. So Joe Burrow in pads on Tuesday, let's go. And adding pads for Joe Burrow, probably much less interesting than adding pads for everyone else, but definitely interesting that he will be practicing. But for guys like the running backs, for the trench players, adding the pads and adding some thumping goes a long way in in Zach Taylor's words, telling you whether the guys that appear to be meeting expectations before pads come on are actually where you think they are. And that mm -hmm. was a big point of emphasis. You'll hear that from coaches at this time of year, from analysts at this time of year across the NFL when pads come on, things get a little bit more real and you can figure out a little bit more clearly where you're at in a lot of ways. You know, Zach saying that he's pleased with where the running backs are, but when the pads come on, the pass protection element becomes a little bit more real and, and a little bit more of an emphasis for the running backs. Getting out into fr from the pass protection responsibilities into your check down responsibilities, uh, timing things up with your offensive line in the running game, all of these things in that whole aspect of the game i.e. everything except Joe Burrow throwing to receivers, which is very interesting to Cincinnati Bengals fans, but only part, you know, 40% or so, 30% of the Cincinnati Bengals football team when you think about defense and the other bits of the offense and special teams and all these things. All that stuff ramps up a lot more too. And so the management approach from the Cincinnati Bengals through the five unpadded practices to start training camp has seemed to be filled with rest for veterans, rotating rest on different days for different guys and getting them ready to go when the pads are on. And hopefully that pays dividends and hopefully, you know, no major injuries to this point, you know, knock on wood and that continues. Oh my God. Only minor bumps and bruises so far as they are preparing to step it up when the intensity ratchets up with pads on. You just given everyone a reason to blame you if, if something does happen. And like you Great. said, knock on wood, but my God. Bring it on Same every year. Like I mean, I just don't believe in jinxes. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, the here analytic we go. Jake. Yeah, here we go. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable at this point. <laughs> I, I just want a quiet camp, and uh, it's still not going to be a quiet camp. It's been pretty quiet for those practicing. But uh, those not practicing, it's certainly been pretty loud, right? Whether it's – even if they're not the ones talking. So, yeah, I think – we're going to see who I'm excited to see. Honestly, I want to see Amarius Mims. We're not going to see Trent Brown yet, uh, but we will. Uh, we'll see him in the near future. I think next week. I'll just give a timeline on it. I think we'll see him next week. He's fine. I I, I said it on our last show. He's fine. He's getting there, and uh, I think we'll see Trent Brown in pads as, as soon as next week or out there on the practice field some. But uh, yeah, I think Amarius Mims in pads mm -hmm. could be even more destructive than Amarius Mims without pads. I'm excited to see him for sure. Uh, obviously uh, you, you've focusing on the trenches, the young guys as well in that defensive line are, are going to be a few guys, by the way, real quick practice note that we're going to get into just because I mentioned young guys. And I thought of your guy, Matt Lee, uh, Trey Hill took a few snaps at center today and a really high snap to Joe Burrow and shotgun. Just I would forget about it later, so I'm mentioning it now. Uh, that's a good shout. And, and as far as I know, Trey Hill has been the second team center. So we'll see if Matt yeah. Lee can can work up that depth chart. But today with a lot of the veterans out, it looked like Deontay Smith at left tackle. It's, it looks like it's Trey Hill at center. Cody Ford. Jackson right Carmen guard. at left tackle too. Okay. They so rotation rotating. at left tackle. Yeah. As they try to figure out the, the backups in that offensive line room, something we'll continue to monitor as well, of course, with pads coming on. The other big one, uh, since we recorded last, James, was Eric All, his clearance to return to practice. Zach Taylor kind of tamped down the expectations for Eric All, so we will discuss coming up next 
what is expected for Eric all and some other practice observations from the last couple of days to finish up today's show. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which means if you're hanging out at the banks, you know, oh, and the Reds are in town this week, by the way. Uh, let's go to the Reds game. Well, if you have the Game Time app downloaded, you can take advantage of their zone deals, of their last minute deals, of all of the awesome things that come with having the Game Time app. You get views from your seat and it makes buying Major League Baseball tickets that easy. And it's not just MLB tickets. No, no, no. Maybe you're thinking, going on the road to watch the Bengals this year, coming to Cincinnati to watch the Bengals. Game Time is going to have the tickets for you. You have panoramic views from your seat. You know exactly what you're getting, all in pricing. And every event that you're thinking about going to, any event that you're thinking about going to, whether it's a concert this summer, whether it's Major League Baseball, whether it is the Big Three, which is coming here, by the way, Ice Cube's Basketball League, Game Time is going to have it for you. So download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N NFL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. James, you've got two practices to catch up on, and Eric All participated in those practices as he was cleared from the non football injury list because his injury occurred in college, wasn't eligible for the NFL based pup list, physically unable to perform list. And Zach Taylor said on Monday that it would be very much an easing back in for Eric All, but he will get to be involved with walkthroughs. He will get to be involved with individual work. He will get to start catching up a little bit on the field. They will keep him away from contact, at least for a little bit of time, as they'll ease him into the more intense parts of practice. But that really highlights the glut of tight ends on this roster. Five guys that they know and like, and Zach Taylor made sure to call out Cam Grandy as an undrafted free agent tight end that he really likes as well. And Man, that gets complicated from a roster construction perspective. These tight ends where Eric Hall, fourth round pick, probably can can write him in on pen on the roster. They obviously have Mike Kosecki and Drew Sample as the veterans on this team. Those guys are going to make the team. And then Tanner McLaughlin and Tanner Hudson gets very interesting where Mm -hmm. you try to make those decisions and figure out where those guys fall. But any early observations on Eric Hall while we talk about all these tight ends? Yeah, he one, he's not doing contact stuff. I, I didn't see him in any team stuff, so he's just doing individual right now. But I think you can know, like, note right away, like, oh, he moves pretty well. And you, you just watch him and how he moves, and he's just smooth and in, in and out of his routes. Now, I haven't watched him a ton. Again, it's just individuals. You got to see him. Uh, get out there against competition for it to to stand out and, and how that works or, or how that how he fares in those situations we'll see. But yeah, I, I think you can kind of notice that he moves a little differently than than some of the other tight ends in that room, even though most of those guys are good pass catchers and talented guys and talented route runners. So I honestly I think Eric All, his path is can he be the second best blocker in that room? which I think is pretty realistic when you think about Mike Kosicki, Tanner McLaughlin, and Tanner Hudson, and at least what we know them to be. That Obviously, Drew Sample is going to lead that blocking tight end element, and he's going to get a ton of snaps because of it. But if I'm Eric All, show you can block. Because if you show you can block, you're the second guy in that room that can do it. You're going to be active probably on game day if you show you're, you're physically able to uh, – to hold up not only as a blocker, but also do what you did in, in college uh, through the air and in the passing game. So he's the one guy that has a chance to be kind of the, the complete tight end. And it's really about his health more than anything. Take your time with him, Bengals. And, and that's the good news is they have the luxury of all these other guys ahead of him right now. I, th- I think that is what makes it kind of challenging from a, do they keep five tight ends? C- can they somehow keep five tight ends? Can they convince themselves to keep five tight ends conversation? Because you've got this acclimation period for rookie tight ends in general. You've got a couple of day three tight ends. Eric Hall could have been picked earlier had he not dealt with injuries and had he played a full year in his last year in college. And we didn't get to see that, unfortunately. And then Tanner McLaughlin, a sixth round pick, 
generally tight ends aren't ready to be major contributors in year one in the NFL. Some are, there are exceptions to that rule, but we don't really know yet what these guys are. And the Cincinnati Bengals coaching staff doesn't really know yet either. They've seen Tanner McLaughlin now for five practices after he didn't participate in the off season program as he was recovering from a core muscle injury himself. And they've seen Eric Hall now for two very limited practices as they ease him back in. So you have these two very unknown quantities in these rookies and three guys who have had varying degrees of success in the NFL. Tanner Hudson, the biggest question there, right? You can easily put him behind uh, Drew Sample and Mike Kosicki on the depth chart. But a guy that last year in training camp stood out as the best receiving tight end on the roster during the year last year was the best receiving tight end on the roster, continues to make plays in training camp this year. And as Dan Horde and others, including us, have pointed out in the past, has a trust of the quarterbacks on this team has been a very productive player. And so figuring out that room, figuring out what they have in the rookies over the course of this training camp will be very important as they make those roster decisions. And that's a tough call because you've got a lot of receiving tight ends on this team now that are kind of one dimensional. And so to your point, talking about Eric Hall, if he can be that all round guy and he can show that and he's healthy enough to show that before the season, that decision gets much easier. But until then, I do think it's very challenging and there are major questions to answer as they make those decisions. Yeah, I think in a perfect world, he vaults to the first tight end off the bench, essentially, mm -hmm. whether it's Gasicki or Sample, if either of those guys get, gets nicked up and allows your offense to operate the way you're hoping the offense operates with whoever it is. Now, maybe that's McLaughlin a little bit, or maybe it's Tanner Hudson. Heck, Hudson had, talk about practice observations, had a heck of a catch that I tweeted out on Sunday night, and he was able to, make a nice catch on the sideline, falling, gets both feet down, might have gotten a, a third toe down. Um, there's a really, really nice catch on the sideline. And he's had a few nice catches on the sideline. He just kind of reminds everyone, hey, I know there's these other these other flashier tight ends or draft picks, but uh, I'm a pretty solid pass catcher, and we've seen that so far throughout camp. Yeah, a reliable target who isn't necessarily the flashiest or most athletic tight end in the world, but as a veteran at this point, he's got that experience in the NFL. He's that savvy zone-beating tight end receiving reliability threat where that's an important thing to have, somebody that you can trust in that role. And we'll see if one of those rookies can do enough for them to feel good about one of them being that guy off the bench. And perhaps there are just more tight ends playing this year for the Bengals. There's a a clip of 13 personnel, meaning one running back, three tight ends, one, three, 13 personnel from the Bengals on Monday. We're seeing a lot more under center work continue throughout this training camp. We're seeing even a little bit of pistol, which uh, you can observe in the clip on Twitter. Uh, it's actually the play where Sam Hubbard ends up leaving practice on Sunday night. Mike Kosecki pulling across the formation on a play action play out of pistol to try to block Sam Hubbard. He bounces off of Sam. And uh, glad Sam's okay in that collision. Don't necessarily love the idea of Mike Gusecki being the guy you're pulling across the formation in a pass protection situation in play action uh, for the reason that you see in the clip. But point is, you're seeing a lot of an interesting involvement from the tight ends as they explore their personnel versatility there with a deeper, hopefully, tight end room. And you're seeing more positional or more formational uh variety from the Cincinnati Bengals throughout training camp as well. And those are some pretty cool trends to monitor as they look to spice things up from play action to motion at the snap and all these things that are uh, hallmarks of modern NFL offenses at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I think the evolution continues in, in how they incorporate, by the way, do they keep three running backs in, in, in their minds list sample as an H back? and then keep four tight ends. Like, could they do that? Uh, you know what I think it comes down to? I think it comes down to Tanner McLaughlin really forcing their hand. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because he's similar to what they have. He's an older prospect. Can he show, hey, I'm ready to go right now? Because yeah. if so, it's really tough. And, and Tanner Hudson, by the way, didn't make the team to start last year. And so he can make it tough on them. I, I think that that's uh, going to be something that will uh, we'll follow the tight end battle. Is yeah. here, Jake. Let's go. Another position battle that we'll be watching. He didn't make the team, and we both know that he should have. And I think they realized pretty quickly that he should have. That was just a bad there, decision. There were people here that thought he should have too. Yeah. I'll say uh, the, the, and, the, and for our audio listeners, here means I'm at the stadium. So people in the building. 
that there were Cincinnati Bengals employees, there you go. coaching staff members, perhaps personnel members, perhaps. Uh, I, I, I'm not even going that. I'm just saying people, people who work for the yeah. Bengals, people. people, people who work people, for the Bengals, people. No? Some people other in the building. Some other position battles that we will continue to watch as the pads come on are the cornerback two battle as Dax Hill and DJ Turner continue to go at it. Dax catching a lot of flack for uh, giving up a touchdown to Kendrick Pryor in the back of the end zone. Also had a nice pass breakup going against D Higgins. DJ Turner also had a nice pass breakup going against D Higgins. So those guys continue to battle. Trent Irwin. Like, yeah, it's, it, it, it's the nature of social corner, media right? is hilarious it's like yeah. oh these boys are getting toasted it's like yeah it's cornerback life with joe burrow quarterback and, and you're only yeah. seeing some clips and and no doubt you know, no you're, doubt you're, i can't record everything you're gonna see you're gonna see all these battles come down to the preseason games as, as we continue to discuss pads coming on preseason game just over a week away at this point a week and a half away i guess at this point and, and then we'll learn a lot more about these battles that so really start in the eyes of this coaching staff as Zach Taylor said on Monday, when the pads come on. So if you're talking battles, now is the time for those to start. That's the time for this podcast, however, to stop. That's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Until next time, thanks for listening. Hooday, and have a good one.